Welcome. In previous episodes, we've discussed the importance of philosophy, but not any philosophy, the right kind of philosophy. We also have discussed that there's one reality, but now we want to talk about reason. Is reason an absolute? With me, it's Onkar Gad and Harry Bingswanger from the Enron Institute. Thank you, Onkar and Harry, for, for doing this series that I think uh, it's very useful for people who are thinking what's the importance of ideas and the importance and the role of philosophy in their lives. We've talked about philosophy, we've talked about one reality, and now we're going to talk about reason as an absolute. Can we know objective truth? What are the tools, Ankar, that we have to know that objective truth? Um, we actually touched on this in the last episode because questions about the basic nature of reality, so what in philosophy is the branch of called metaphysics and epistemology, they go together. So you brought up some questions when we were saying, yeah, there is a reality, it's out there, there's one truth, there's facts that you're trying to know. You brought up all kinds of skeptical arguments of, how, well, can we really know things? Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, if you proceed properly, so what are our means of knowledge? That is what epistemology is studying. And in a nutshell, it's we have to use our senses to look out at the world that exists independently from us. Then we have to process the information, which we do by abstractions or concepts, which we put into principles and theories that enable us to grasp everything there is out there in reality, one by one, slowly. But we have minds that are, have this power if we use them properly. Now, uh, through the scientific discoveries, we discover every time that uh, we find a truth, that there are more truths to be discovered, and that leaves room for people to justify the things that are still unknowable with some explanations. So, Harry, what alternatives have been offered for how we know? Well, first of all, let me correct you. The unknown is not unknowable. There are things that are unknown, but everything is knowable. Okay. Everything can be learned eventually. Uh, the um, major answers that have been given to how we know, in fact, all of the answers can be classified under a few very small number of heads, is mysticism, which says we know by revelation, we know by no specific sensory or logical means, we just know, we intuit, we hear the voice of God, it just comes to us as a, like a feeling. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, that's completely non-tenable mm -hmm. and cannot explain the different intuitions that different people have contradictory, but it, it's there as a view. The opposite view to we, we just know is we just don't know. That's called skepticism. We don't know anything. We don't know that we don't know. And we don't know that we don't know that we don't. I mean, it's just an endless cycle of negations of itself. And that's an untenable position because you can't take a position that says there are no positions. So uh, in between there, there's the three kind of semi-sensible viewpoints between mysticism and skepticism are rationalism, which says knowledge comes through reason but reason divorced from the senses. Reason as pure logic without any observation of reality. A priori, before experience. Reason as uh, a, a self-contained kind of faculty. And at the other end uh, from that is empiricism, which mm -hmm. says, no, uh, the senses are everything. Mm -hmm. And reason is nothing. So one of them says reason is everything, the senses are nothing. And the other one says senses are everything, reason is nothing. In essence, I'm simplifying, you know. And then wait, wait, okay, okay, wait okay. for it. <laughs> the right view is that reason operates on sensory material, that the senses are the start and base of all knowledge. Everything we know came through the senses directly or indirectly. But that we go beyond the animals who just have sense perception mm -hmm. to abstract and use logic to understand what's given in sense perception. Mm 
-hmm. So that is the objectivist view, which is neither reason without senses or senses without reason, but reason applied to sensory observation. Okay, so taking that into account, what I understand is there is two extremes. Mm -hmm. uh, mysticism, right. we know everything, uh, but, but it's not through reason, it's a uh, revelation. For, for, uh, revelation. Yeah. And then we have asceticism, which is we don't know no, anything. 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 And then we have rationalism and empiricism mm -hmm. in between this pendulum. Yeah. And rationalism tends to go with mysticism. If you push it yeah. far, it yeah. ends up in mysticism. Right. And, and empiricism, empiricism tends to lead to skepticism. Okay. Can we uh, give an example to the audience on how one phenomenon would be explained through these four? Let, let's say, for example, gravity. Uh -huh. Mysticism would say it's a force that God put it here, uh, right? No, no. Mysticism would just say, I think gravity ends above the clouds. Why do you think that? I don't know. I just, I just. Feel, like it. feel that way. Uh, I, or uh, I think gravity gets stronger the further away you get. Why do you think or, that? Well, I read it in the, in, in the sacred text. You know, uh, as skepticism says gravity, I don't know, there was gravity a minute ago. Will there be gravity tomorrow? I don't know. I have no reason to think there will be gravity tomorrow. Who knows? Who can say? We don't know anything. Right. And uh, then the, um, the rationalist would be a, a, a philosopher who said, well, no, I can prove that there's gravity and I can prove how it goes by just starting with a few simple axioms. Where did those axioms come from? Well, we don't ask that question. So like things are either simple or complex. If they're complex, they're composed of the simples. If the simples interact and he goes through a chain of reasoning starting just from nowhere right and the empiricist uh would would say well let's go out and measure gravity in different places and that's it all we can say is there's gravity here and it's this force and there's gravity there and that force and we have statistical tables mm -hmm. and we show what but we never reach the law of the force of gravity is proportional to the inverse of the square of the radius of the distance of the bodies from each other, which is Newton's law of gravity. Mm -hmm. uh, you just have a bunch of separate observations. You say, I don't know if it'll be that way tomorrow. Right. That's empiricism. So obviously that's one step away from, I don't know what gravity is. Right. And the crazed building of castles in the air is one step uh, uh, closer to reality than the mystic who says, I had a vision that gravity stops in the clouds. It's, it's just as arbitrary, it's only tricked up in a kind of phony reasoning. So the right view is you make observations and you get the principle. Mm -hmm. You get the principle. Gravity, is at, it, all matter attracts other matter with a force equal to the inverse of the square of the distance between the centers of the two bodies. And it, it's related to the mass of the bodies. So you have a whole science and that's, you know, that's what we've had since Newton. What about uh, Onkar? Do you think that with with this into mind, how can Anne Rand said reason is an absolute, and and what what does she mean by that? She means that it's an absolute, that it's your only means to knowledge. And if you're really after the truth, if you're after grasping the facts, you have to use reason, and you have to use it all the time, about every area, about every subject in life. So I think one of the things that's very distinctive about her thinking and her work and mm -hmm. surprises people when uh, they encounter Ayn Rand, they read Atlas Shrugged or The Fountainhead, or one of the nonfiction books like The Virtue of Selfishness, is she applies reason to everything, um, including philosophy. She, she thinks all the questions in philosophy have to be answered by using reason that properly philosophy is a science. And it's the same basic methodology, mm -hmm. which in, in its most abstract form is you make observations and then you try to conceptualize and understand those observations and you put them into form, in the form of theories that you have induced from the concrete observation. And she, it's, though there are people who will really rebel against reason totally and say, I'm not going to go by it at all, yeah. the, the norm is for people to say, I'll go by it when I want to. 
and I won't go by it when I don't want to. And so they try to cheat or they try to escape. And there's all kinds of different forms of doing this, of trying to evade, and this is the word that Ayn Rand uses, you try to escape or evade the facts of reality because you don't like these particular facts. Mm -hmm. um, and you try to pretend otherwise or even to rewrite the facts. I mean, I'll give you a simple example, but there's all kinds of this kind of wishful thinking. I lived in a, an apartment building in Toronto. I was on the 13th floor, but you couldn't call it the 13th floor. And so my address <laughs> was the fourth, and it was on the premise that if we don't name and say this is the 13th floor, then it won't be the 13th floor. Right. And, it's, so it's, and that kind of person won't do this in every area of their lives, but where they don't want to just accept the facts and go by reason, they try to escape it. And she's saying, if you take seriously your own life, you, you should take seriously that you want to know the truth, and then you should embrace reason as an absolute, not once in a while or when I feel like it. I'd like to give another example uh, of that, of the, of the faking of reality to escape reason. The self-esteem movement in schools, you know, where children are told, great, what you did was great. You, everybody's a winner. Everybody is special. We don't make distinctions on the basis of grade. Every answer is a good answer. Oh, what's the capital of Ontario? Banff. Good, good answer. Does anybody have another answer? No, it's not Banff. So uh, the, um, the, the idea that you can put self-esteem, you can make a child respect each, himself by hearing other people tell him he's good, yeah. even when he knows he's not, is like we're gonna fake reality and it'll become true. He, he will respect himself. He'll feel that he is knowledgeable and efficacious because so many people have told him he is. Right. That's faking reality. Now, when, when we face uh, reason, some people think that reason and emotions are completely opposite. And uh, there's a saying in Spanish, I don't know if in English, but like uh, the heart wants what the heart wants and the mind is always like trying to, you know, rescue the heart from uh, bad decisions, but the heart will go. And this goes along with like this romantic notion that love hurts and love is suffering and love is sacrifice. So it, 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 they teach you since you're young that your heart is gonna want something and your reason is gonna try to like Pull, pull it back to a proper track and, uh, and that they never get along. So if you follow reason, it means that you should quit emotions. Now, what are emotions and what's their proper role? If it, if it is true that emotions fight reason, then how do you behave as a human being? Because you have both emotions and reason. Well, can I jump in on this? First of all, that's Plato. Uh -huh. That comes right out of Plato. It might be even older than Plato, but Plato's certainly the guy who said the soul has three parts, a rational part, an emotional part, and this, what he called the moral part or the spirited part. So the truth is that you have only one brain, and that, that brain is involved in supplying information both to the reasoning process and to the emotion process. So emotions come from the same data bank that your reason does, only it comes from a, uh, what comes up by habit automatically. Mm -hmm. That is, it's your value judgments of what, what's good for you and what's bad for you produce your emotions. But when your mind, your reason is at war with your emotion and your reason is pulling this way and your emotions are pulling that way, the emotions are your habitual automatized snap judgment reactions and your mind presumably hopefully if you did it right is your considered judgment so it's really not an issue of the heart versus the mind the heart doesn't think it's what is immediately apparent to you without thinking mm -hmm. and what sober reflection shows you so it's a snap judgment versus a real rational judgment and the role of the emotions is to prompt action to motivate you and give you the enjoyment of success when you succeed. Uh, succeed. It's not to guide you. 
to guide you is your intellect, your mind, because it takes into account everything you know, not just what is like immediately in front of you. I think it's really important to get for in the objectivist view that there's not that choice, therefore. So it's not, I have to right. choose one or the other. You should choose both if you understand the role of that both should and can play in life. So it's, it's a philosophy that's pro-emotion. It's against using emotions to guide you and to tell you what is true, what is false. Mm -hmm. But it's, emotions are partly, what Harry was bringing up, it's part of the enjoyment of life, the motivation for life um, and for pursuing values. But they also tell you what your past thinking and values have been. Yeah. And it's really important to reflect on those. So Ayn Rand was that people don't explore their emotions enough, right. not that they're, they're they, um, that they try to drive them down or something. They ignore them when you shouldn't. You should think, why am I feeling this? Uh, what is, wh where is this coming from? What did I think before? And sometimes it's your past thinking was better than your current view. Yeah, that um, can happen. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it, so it brings to the, if you pay attention to your emotions, it brings to the fore all the things that you've thought and valued. And you now have to make a considered judgment in the present using all of that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a radically pro-emotion. It, and the goal is that you tie these together so that you understand why you feel what you feel, why you value what you value. Well, in psychotherapy, uh, what, what it's been discovered is that if you don't pay attention to your emotions and the way you were brought up, and the scars and the traumas and the things that happened to you in the past, you're gonna constantly repeat the cycles that were inherited by your mother or your father with your new uh, partners, with your romantic partners. So people stumble upon one and again thinking I'm suffering, I'm in love with someone that rationally I, I wouldn't choose, but my heart, you know, aches for that person. But that, uh, now, you know, psych psychological uh, findings show that if you don't pay attention to your emotions and you don't sit down and say, why am I feeling what am I yeah, feeling? Right. You know, like, where does this come from? And yeah. you don't resolve those unsolved issues from and your past, you're going to repeat uh And what do I, what do I, what's it, what attracts me? What aspects of it? So, like, let's say, he's an alcoholic, mm -hmm. right? This would be a common thing. Woman's in love with a man, but he's an alcoholic and under the influence of alcohol, he gets abusive and he hurts her and the children, you know. But she's not in love with him for the alcoholism. Right. She's in love with him for something else. And if she, if she breaks down the package, you know, what is good in him that I like? What do I see that can really resolve that conflict mm -hmm. and can f help her find a man, if, if that's the answer, it might not be the but help her find a man who has that without the alcoholism because it's something she's responding to. Now, you know, some psychological theories would say, well, her father was an alcoholic and she admired her father, so she thinks that an alcoholic is like her father. I don't think that's really a, a serious motivation. That could enter in, but I don't think that really accounts for, it doesn't account for love. That would be codependency exactly. if, if, if it occurs. But, but I think there's some you, value that the woman is finding. In you that. can also fall in the cycle of codependency when you don't pay attention to your emotions and, yeah, and, yeah. and when you don't uh, listen to what your emotions are telling you, right? Right. So if, if we understand that reason and emotions work together and you become a coherent and happier human yes, being. Yes, but let's be clear. They work by doing different things. Just as your stomach is not your guide, your brain is your guide, your heart, your quote, emotions are not your guide. They are information to use, they are incentives, or there are things you want to maximize, but they don't tell you what's gonna help you and what's gonna hurt you. They tell you like a childish, uh, habitual, past view of what's going to help you or hurt you, which may be true or it may be false. It may be smart or it may be stupid, but your mind has to decide that. So the role of the emotions is to uh, make your values real for you. That's what they do. They make your values real, make you act for them, 
rather than just you know sit back and die because yeah I guess if I don't eat I will starve and I'll go out of existence but I don't have any emotions like Spock on, on the original Star Trek really couldn't have acted if you didn't have any emotions mm -hmm. why would you do anything why would you care you wouldn't care that's right. what caring is an emotion so they they work together but in the sense that one performs function a and one performs function b mm -hmm. and you can't mix them and try and switch them and have do opposite things now understanding that we have that uh those tools some people say okay yeah but there's there's reason but there's something way more important which is faith and they talk about faith and I remember uh, growing up in Catholic school, you know, like wh whenever you ask questions of things that just didn't add up, it was like, you just need a little bit more of faith. And I was like, okay, well, where in my mind do I put the faith up? Yeah. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> what is faith? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question because I have, uh, this is in my wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. Faith is presented like in the story that you tell as if it were another channel that you can tune into. Listen to your faith, have faith, turn it on. What faith actually is, is make-believe. That's the faculty, it's imagination. So when people are saying to you, you've got to have faith, they mean you've got to pretend. Mm -hmm. There is no other thing that you can Fake do. Fake it till you make it or what? Fake it and you, and you won't you make won't it, make. But, you, but it'll be too late. <laughs> So, so if people, like I wrote a, a, a post for my a blog saying, I just discovered that I'm a world champion skier. And not only that, even though I'm 75 years old, I discovered that I'm a world class ski jumper. And even though I've barely skied at all, I, I know this. How do I know? Because I know through faith. Okay. Faith has revealed to me that I'm a world, you would say, well, that's crazy. Faith can't reveal to you that you're a world champion skier. Uh, that's, you're just deluding yourself. Yeah, and that's all there is. That's what belief in God or belief in the afterlife or belief in anything that people say they have on faith means. It means lie to yourself. Pretend. Let's play a game. Let's play make believe. Because, of, you know, even Mother Teresa at the, in her diaries said at the end of the life her faith had failed her it's like God's not talking to her anymore there's there is no there's nothing to turn on there's no switch if, if somebody says clench your fist you can do it if somebody says have faith the only thing you can that's under your control is well I can pretend that's it there isn't anything to do right other than that and this tied back to the one of the first questions you asked about when you don't know something, mm -hmm. th there's two. Uh, the scientific option is uh, to say, I don't know, let's find out. And to find out, you have to engage in observation, in reasoning, and so on. And, or you can invent stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's right to think a lot of the primitive religions, it's we don't know where the wind comes from, where do these storms come from. So, so they invent some story. Okay. But it's all just imagination. You can understand in a very primitive context why, because they feel out of control and this is better than nothing it seems to, but in a scientific concept, context, but, that's but the, the, the problem is that the scientific uh, method has been around for uh, 300 years, let's say, and, 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 and still it has a lot of uh, obstacles because it has been, uh, you know, conflicting with, with religion and with faith, so it has tried to be prohibited. No, I don't see it that way, Gloria. The, no? What I see happen is that the, as science got started, faith started to decline, started to recede radically. And yeah. you had the first declared atheists around the time of the birth of science. Yeah. Uh, there weren't any declared atheists until the French encyclopedist. Uh, but after that, in the 1700s, the people started to say, well, I, I don't believe. What then happened was not that there was a lot of resistance from religion there were philosophers who fought back for religion. The uh -huh. biggest one is Immanuel Kant. Uh -huh. And everyone, he wrote at the same time the US was founded in 1776, he wrote the Critique of Pure Reason, which said the world that reason knows is not real, mm -hmm. and the real world reason cannot know. So he had tricky arguments or what appeared to be arguments to 
to support this, and he took over. So it's a strangled science. The philosophers fought back against the science and saved. Re In fact, that's what, what Kant said he would aim to do, to save re religion from science. Okay. I found I had to deny reason to make room for faith. It's in the introduction to the critique of pure reason. So the philosophers counterattacked. Now, science had a certain momentum, so it kept going for quite a while, but it's undercut, and religion felt, oh, we're scientific, actually. I mean, this philosopher says that we're just as scientific as the scientists. Mm -hmm. And re religion was brought back to life by bad philosophers, not by people's resistance. Thank you for clearing, clarifying that <laughs> history lesson. But, but that's precisely my point. Like, science hasn't been around for that long no. compared to the rest of, yeah. of uh, the human history. So because it, it has been a short time for science, there are a lot of things that we still don't know. And that gives room for humanity to make an explanation on mysticism, on faith, mm, on, uh, no, on any other thing. I don't agree thing. with that. We know a thousand times more than we knew in a more secular age. Like in the 1800s, of course, uh, there was less. In fact, when I went to college in the 60s, I didn't know anyone who was seriously religious. So there's been a change, and people from my generation talk about it. religions had a big comeback mm -hmm. since the 60s. And we know a ton more than we knew in the 60s in science. So it's not areas of ignorance that open the door. It's because the philosophers have been attacking reason and science for 200 years, and they're making progress yeah, in that. Because I would ask you a question in exactly the other direction. That we, if you think in terms of the human race, the human race has been ignorant for thousands of years, and then we get science, and for three, and it, it's a short period of time, 300 years, the explosion in knowledge is just, it was unimaginable prior to the advent of science. So why wouldn't people's position be, well, obviously this is the only way to gain knowledge, and all these other things are useless, including faith and so Why wouldn't that be the reaction? But it seems to me that the way it works is until science makes an explanation, people then give up their faith or their religion. But, but first, science has to like catch up with that. If, if science doesn't have an answer, then people are uh, more comfortable with, with blind faith and the explanation of like there's a supernatural power. I think they get less comfortable. So, yeah. Uh, here's an interesting sidelight to that since you brought that up. You know all the prophets throughout history of which Jesus is one, but also Moses and Jehovah and all these prophets who come down saying, I have spoken to God, God has talked to yeah. me, and here's the word. None of them ever stated any fact that was not known before. None of them came down and said, God has told me that the earth it revolves around the sun, which is just another star, like the stars we see in the sky, but we're close to it, so it looks different. None of them say, uh, God has told me boil water before you drink it because there are little things in water that can make you sick if, it's, if they're there. So always boil water. None of them came down and said, you know the ratio of the diameter of a circle to the circumference of the circle should be given a name. Let's give it a letter like pi. Mm -hmm. And that's constant for all circles. And that could be, none of them came down and told us anything we didn't already know. They came down and said, you know, uh, don't hold any other gods before me or uh, hold the Sabbath holy. Now, none of them came down with knowledge. So it's not the ignorance. It's not that people say, well, gee, we don't know so maybe there's room for faith. After all, the prophets were the one who told us to boil water. No, okay. <laughs> they never told us anything. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, that's right. But can reason be proved? Can you, can you go to people that you know, still doubt that reason is a, it's the only tool they have to understand reality and say, yeah, and I can prove it to you. Can you do that? Um, 
I don't think it can be proved, it can be validated, which is a, a similar but not the same notion. Because if you're asking for a proof, you're asking, show me in reason um, what the proof of, a proof is a concept about reason. Mm -hmm. um, so you're already, when asking for a proof, you're accepting reason. But if the question is, why should I accept reason? It's because it's your only tool of knowledge. And you can use reason to show that, look, the senses give me information about the world and concepts, when I properly use them and form them, enable me to generalize and then I can make theories and I can induce. You can show what reason is doing, so how it's processing information. But you're using reason to show that this is how reason mm -hmm. functions. And in that sense, you can't get outside of reason and prove it by some other means. Um, you have to use, it's your only tool of knowledge, so you have to use it so in the, everything. So the person is assuming, well, you have to prove it. After all, if you don't have a reason for believing it, why should you believe it? Don't have a reason to believe it? Yeah. So they already accepting reason when they ask you, do you have a proof? Uh, I had a friend who used to have a cute way of saying, yeah, I've got a proof. Okay, what's your proof of reason? Well, I like it a lot. It feels good. And then they say, well, that's no proof. Well, what, you want a proof in reason? Is that what you want? You see? It makes a point. It's all right. The concept of proof is not a primary. The first thing is to look and see. I don't prove to you that I have a hand. Here's my hand, right? There's no proof. Proof is what we use when we can't directly perceive something. And not everything has to be proved. Some things are self-evident. Now, reason's value is not really self Would you say it's self-evident? I think it does need some discussion. Yeah. But it's not proved. It's validated. It's, it's shown to be right, but not by process of logic and proof the way that reason itself does. That would be certain. What about um, quantum physics and, uh, and, and, and some people's uh, effort into mixing science with what we be believe is mysticism, but not from like, like a religious standpoint, but the fact that maybe as human beings, we are connected in ways that right now science cannot explain. But for example, mind reading or telekinesis or things like that, like uh, when, when you are thinking of someone and that person just calls you and it's like, oh, I was just thinking about you, you know, or, or sometimes coincidences that happen that you could not apply a scientific method to explain. Uh, I, I have a... Can I, I tell you a story I had personally? Yeah, I sure. Uh, I was going to drive up to a friend's for New Year's Eve. I lived in Manhattan and he lived in the suburbs and I was going to have to rent a car and drive at night. And I had a premonition the night before that I was going to get in a terrible accident in the car. And, uh, you know, I kind of dismissed it and we got into the car and it started snowing and it got apprehensive. And you know what actually happened? Mm -hmm. Nothing. Nothing. Okay. So Bye. I should go on television and tell my story, right? Because I had this premonition and it didn't turn out. Right, okay. So, so you so, see the point. There's yeah. a confirmation. You don't remember that, that 50,000 50, right. experiences. We say, I just know this is going to be it. Oh, no, it wasn't. No. Mine and then it. when it happens, when it it's happens like, the okay, one. you confirm the yeah, one. Okay, right. I, get, I get that, but let, let me put you another example. Uh, in the, in the Spanish-speaking world, there is a, a theory, I don't know, to call it a theory, a tradition, what it is, but they say that when someone dies, mm -hmm. a black um, butterfly appears, right? Uh, and so if you see black butterflies, like death is near. Okay, that's like one of the thousands of myths mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, the night that my grandmother died, and I was there, like no one told me this, I was there, um, she, she passed away and I, went, I go out of her room and there was a ble big black butterfly on the ceiling. And I am an aseptic, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in that kind of thing. So I grabbed my cell phone and I was like, I'm going to take a picture of this because tomorrow I don't even going to believe like what my senses are telling me. Now, maybe in 200 years, science comes with an explanation that says that, I don't know, the scent of some of, uh, of a body decomposing or whatever brings up the black butterflies. I have no idea, but what, I, what, what I'm trying to, to tell you or with the premonition is that Every time there is not 
a specific explanation, there is room for humanity to find an explanation for things that is not going to be reasonable or is not going to be based yeah. on reason. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Nature abhors a vacuum <laughs> and the mind tries to make sense of things like that seem to be coincidences. Mm -hmm. But that's irrational. What can I say? So you don't Drop believe, it. many of you believe that there would come a point where science can maybe prove that we communicate uh, telepathically between human beings or that there are more knowledge to our senses than the one we have right now? Nope. Okay. I mean, I, I, I don't think we're going to be alive to prove it or well, not. I hope we are. <laughs> I hope we are. I do believe right. in genetic research to extend the lifespan dramatically. Okay. So. But, I, but I think the question, it's, that question is the same question as the coincidence. Because the first thing has to be, is there something here that needs explanation? Yeah. So I think part of your answer about um, is there going to be telepathic communication is like there's no evidence at all that there's some phenomenon that we can explain that we're trying to explain and maybe telepathy is the explanation for. And it's the same I think with the butterflies. If it really were the case that um, every, every time you have a corpse you have black butterflies around, then you might start to think well scientifically is there something yeah. that's attracting this? Or, or even two-thirds of the time or yeah. half the time. But yeah. a coincidence is just it's you remember the memorable thing and you forget the ones that uh, have a hundred times where this didn't happen. And so there's nothing to explain Co that it's a coincidence. It's the explanation. But being the devil's advocate, if, if that is the case, you could also say that your reason will only register the things that uh, prove again what your reason already believes. You know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah, but that self affirmation. Isn't true. That, that is, uh, why would you even be looking? It's like, uh, you know, I'm crossing, you, you, you can't limit the irrational. Don't underestimate the irrational in this sense. Mm -hmm. I'm at the street corner on my way to coffee. The heavens didn't open up and a fiery chariot come down with uh, angels on it. Nor did the... Uh, other side of the street burst unaccountably into flame, mm -hmm. nor did ducks rain down from the sky. There's an unlimited number of things about which I could say, aha, I crossed the street and that didn't happen. Right. So that's st score one for reason. You can make up, this goes back to faith is make-believe, you can make up a billion different things and your reason is not going to, you know, the rational man doesn't consider any of them. And he doesn't pat himself on the back. Look, reason explains why it didn't rain right. ducks today. It, it, it just doesn't come up. Right. Well, Harry and Ankar, thank you for this uh, lovely discussion. And, and for everyone that is watching, what else would you recommend in, uh, in all the material that are in the Ayn Rand Institute to keep on exploring about reason? And the well, can I recommend my own book? Yep. I wrote a book called How We Know, How we know. Okay. and it goes into all of these issues. Uh, it's available on Amazon. But of the canonical uh, objectivist material, um, the best thing is Galt's speech in Atlas Shrugged. Mm -hmm. the, the hero of the story has a speech on the radio and he goes into all these philosophic topics. A friend of mine, when he read it the first time, said his impression was reason, 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 reason. So it's all about reason and in, in that uh, speech. Can you think of uh, nonfiction? Uh, yeah, I can. In, in, again, in the book Philosophy, Who Needs It? Mm -hmm. There's an essay, Faith and Forth, mm -hmm. oh, the destroyer yeah. of the modern mind. And world. Modern world, yeah, sorry, yeah. Destroyer of the modern world. And that's very interesting. Uh, we haven't talked yet much about the relationship of faith and political unfreedom or dictatorship tyranny and it's talking why there's a relationship between these and why faith um, after the enlightenment gets a resurgence that's part of what Harry mm -hmm. talked about mm -hmm. with Kant and so yeah. there's a lot in that essay it's very interesting okay well thank you Harry and Ankar and uh, to you stay tuned because we're continuing with this series and don't forget to watch the previous episodes on uh, philosophy and uh, other topics that we've been discussing.